Welcome to BIOPS. Today, we are absolutely thrilled to welcome Alexis Borsi, Chairman, and Christoph Langauer, CSO and co-founders of Curie.bio to the show. Gentlemen, thank you once again for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. To kick things off, let's rewind the clock and ask if you could share brief personal introductions with us. Alexis, would you like to kick things off? Sure. I... Uh chemistry and chemical biology background, uh, PhD dropout, uh, serial entrepreneur, uh, ended up uh, founding, being the CEO chairman of 15 uh, companies, uh, 10 public on the NASDAQ, a couple acquired, uh, accidental venture capitalist, uh, venture capitalist for you know uh, a decade with Third Rock Ventures, uh, and then back into starting companies and then building Curie.bio to help other founders start companies. Excited to dive in deeper. Christoph, yourself? Yeah, um, I'm a biologist by training and I studied biology to better understand diseases and try to cure them. <laughs> I sort of spent my time in three different areas. The first one was for 13 or 15 years in academia. I've been at Johns Hopkins for a long time in the lab of Bert Augustine, where we tried to understand cancer better and the genomics uh, and genetics of cancer. Um, the second, third in Big Pharma, um, I was at Novartis where I built the target ID validation group and then um, at Sanofi as global head of oncology. In the last 15 years or so have been in that third third, which is uh, in the biotech space. A couple of companies um, built and worked on together with Alexis. I love to be an operator. That's where my heart is, uh, like getting shit done. That's sort of what I do. And um, um, yeah, that has been the full, most fulfilling part. And over the last few years that has been connected uh, with um, the VC component. I've been partner at Third Rock and uh, now we combined it also at Curie.bio. You both have incredible backgrounds. We're excited to dive into more deeply and thank you for those overviews. But to help our audience get a grasp of your many experiences up until this point, what would you say your North Star is? The sort of common thread that's been tying your work together as you explore so broadly. Christoph, would you like to start? Yeah, I mean, I think Chris Fiebacher, at the time CEO of Sanofi, now CEO of Biogen, I think summed it up well. He said that in our industry, we are not making bottled waters. We are actually trying to make drugs that save people's lives. And um, that sort of motivates me. That's, that's my North Star. Um, I'm proud to have been part of uh, teams that ended up um, succeeding with the discovery, development, and registration of 10 approved drugs. And um, that's where I get my motivation from. And yeah, I'm, that's my nose star. Alexis? Well, completely agree with uh, what Christoph just said. Um, I would add, love to see what can be made to happen now, right? Uh, science and technology moves to a point, our insights, our understanding, um, I love to see the pieces. You say, wait a second, we can put these pieces together now and this can yield this transformative result that can make a big difference for patients uh, and society. And uh, that's what I love and that's what I love to do. Uh, bringing the puzzle pieces together. And to start doing that, let's talk a little bit more about your journeys to venture and more broadly to bio. So Alexis, you began your career, as mentioned, at the University of Chicago in chemistry and then pursued a graduate degree in chemical biology, chemistry and chemical biology. So taking this back all the way to the beginning, what originally brought you to bio? Why biology for you? Well, so, uh, you know, I started out in physics in college. That's what I assumed. My first uh, laboratory job uh, as a first year at the University of Chicago was in the laboratory of astrophysics and space research, building a high... Uh, energy cosmic ray satellite. And, um, you know, the, the aim was to build a, a warp drive matter, antimatter uh, engine, you know, big Star Trek, nut, nerd, whatever you want to uh, say, and realized sort of the reality of where uh, physics was and what was reasonable or not reasonable uh, to do. 
And uh, along that way, I was taking uh, a bunch of biology classes just because I thought it was interesting. Uh, and I just got really fired up by the beautiful complexity of biology. Now, I was also sort of young and foolish, and there was one uh, course required for the biology degree, which was an animal behavior class. And I thought the course was stupid as, you know, sort of sometimes young, headstrong people can be. And I was like, I'm not going to take this class. What, I'm supposed to go and like go to the zoo and watch behaviors of different animals? Probably actually was a, like in retrospect, would have been a really interesting and informative uh, class, but I was too uh, young to see that. And I felt that the biology was being too squishy. And of course I had had to have taken a bunch of chemistry and the organic chemistry, I could just see the force fields and how the molecules would react. It was just beautiful. It was intuitive. Um, and then to be blunt, like I was starting my fourth year of college and I needed a degree. And I went into the chair of the department. And I said, hey, I didn't take some of the intro courses, but if I just sit down for you right now and like show you that I can take all the exams, like you just ju like, is that okay? And then I'll finish off. I'll just take chemistry courses. And can I get the chemistry degree? And uh, they were kind and allowed that to happen. And I sort of went trundling off uh, in uh, to chemistry. And then at Harvard uh, in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology was studying with Stuart Schreiber uh, and also Greg Verdine and George Whitesides. It was just an amazing group of faculty uh, members. And Stuart was involved, had been involved in uh, getting Vertex Pharmaceuticals up and running. And then uh, at that time when I was in the lab, it was about Ariad Pharmaceuticals uh, getting up and running. And that just opened my eyes to this thing called biotech. Um, I started taking a few classes across the river at Harvard Business School. Uh, and you would sit in these wonderful sort of amphitheaters with your name and you were being cold called and I... Uh, I learned what I like to call the vernacular of this world of business. Uh, and it just seemed a lot of fun and watching what Stuart was doing, loving the science, seeing what was being done and building biotech. And again, still probably being a little impetuous and headstrong. I, I, you know, I was like, okay, well, I just want to go out and learn how to do this. I'm just going to go build a biotech. Uh, it sounds like you were starting to display the founder traits, uh, even in academia. Absolutely love that. And so, as you mentioned, from academia, you went to Vertex Partners before launching your career as an entrepreneur, first founding Combinator RX and then Foundation Medicine. So I guess taking this a step forward from academia, where you were starting to deploy, display that entrepreneurial talent, what led you directly to entrepreneurship? Yeah, you know, I I uh, had done that stint in in strategy consulting for three years. Being in Boston, I considered it sort of my practicum, uh, and it was a chip off of uh, Bain and BCG. And uh, there was a rainmaking partner there who was good friends with the CEO uh, or COO of three of the largest pharmaceutical companies uh, at the time, and we were working on what were their greatest challenges they were facing. So this was a great opportunity to learn why does the industry work the way that it works, as well as to build up my network of people uh, in the industry. And I stayed there while my learning curve was very steep. And as soon as I began to feel that it was flattening out, again, still the impetuousness uh, or maybe entrepreneurialness, maybe more generously, uh, of youth, then I just went out to start my first company, Combinatorix, uh, with a couple friends from graduate school. Uh, I lined up a fantastic super angel uh, investor and, you know, didn't know you weren't supposed to start a biotech company in your 20s. Uh, we just went and did it. And maybe we were naive, uh, maybe we were headstrong, but we just went and did it. And you know, that is one of the things at Curie.bio, uh, why we're building it, because God would have loved to have <laughs> what we're building now at Curie.bio back when I was a 20-something. <laughs> that would have been awesome. There's so many stupid mistakes that we made that it would have been amazing to have that coaching and expertise to be able to, to draw on. 
And we're going to get to that in a moment. But first, Christoph, over to you. After completing your PhD in biology and a first postdoc in molecular bi biology at the IMP in Vienna, Austria, you joined the lab of Bert v uh, Vogelstein at Johns Hopkins. We've remained on the faculty since 1994. So Christoph, for yourself as well, what led you to bio and why the academic path? Yeah, um, <clears throat> got my PhD in Germany, um, went to this elite institute, as you just mentioned, uh, IMP in Vienna. Um, and then I had this crisis. Um, I somehow, as many postdocs or PhD students sort of go through is lab work is hard, most experiments fail, uh, the perspective of success is sometimes not visible. Um, the impact of what we do is measured by publications and not how many people live longer or uh, live better, um, that type of crisis. And um, that was in stark contrast to what else I did at the time. Um, I worked with refugees at the time. I was in jail every morning and detention stale uh, for people who were ready for deportation. Uh, used to do this like from five in the morning till like 7.30. Um, got really engaged in this. Uh, did this together with Amnesty International in collaboration with the High Commissioner of Refugees for the United Nations um, because they were located, they have key offices in Vienna. We stopped playing so that they can't deport people. Um, we saw the success of getting people out of jail. We saw the failure of it when people got shot at the airport when we were deported, and uh, um, and that was that was always immediate. And I like that. I like this. You like you do something, and then like you immediately see what happens with it. And uh, I think that that was somewhat fascinating to me and, and different. Therefore, I was about to give up um, science and said before I sort of dropped this out, um, I felt some responsibility. I was the first uh, person in my extended family who had a high school degree and had a chance to go to college. Therefore, I like, cannot just like drop out now. Therefore, I said, why don't I go what I considered the best molecular genetics lab in the world in the context of oncology. Maybe they take me. And then if I don't like it, I feel pretty good about dropping out. That's why I applied to Bert Wogelstein's lab. I applied on uh, July 4th and started there July 25th. Um, and I loved it. I totally liked it. Uh, I stayed there. We discovered oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. We understood why cancers became resistant to therapy. Um, it was fascinating. But to your question, there was always something missing. And what was missing is, in spite of the fact that our discovery led to many drug discovery programs uh, uh, in, uh, in, in industry, like we discovered PR3K mutation, for example, or BRAF mutations or mutation in IDH, all three of which are now resulted were the basis of, of drugs that are now impactful for patients. But I, I, I felt that was too far away from me. And I felt this connection to patients, the translation of the discovery into this drug making was missing. And that's, that's how I ended up joining Vartis and um, try to combine the discovery with the drug making. Now, the issue was that I knew nothing about drug making and academic people don't understand that necessarily that they do not do that. And that's, by the way, another important feature of Curie.bio that our specialty is that we assemble the group of people who understand drug making, that this this drug embodiment out of a target or an idea or a concept or a technology towards something that you then swallow as a pill and has an effect, that process is really hard. And I um, wanted to learn that, had a chance to learn this in Big Pharma in a very formal way, both at Novartis and at Sanofi, and then I could apply it in biotech. 
That's a wonderful background. Thank you, Christoph. A lot of humanity there. And so just to embellish your own history a bit. Uh, so while on the faculty at Hopkins, as you mentioned, you've worked extensively in industry in places uh, like Novartis and Sanofi, and later serving as co-founder and CSO of startups like Celsius, MoMA Therapeutics, Thrive, Blueprint Medicines. So for yourself, as you mentioned, you had a phenomenal experience translating your work and big companies like uh, Novartis and Sanofi. What led you to straddle the line in the earlier stage with academic uh, entrepreneurship as well and working with startups? Yeah, I mean, as you know, and we all sort of lived it through is that, that I'm thankful to those academic institutions like Hopkins that allow you, to, even if you leave your formal job there as an associate professor in my case, that you can stay affiliated in the concept of what is what's called those adjunct professor positions. And uh, I think that's a very wonderful connectivity that you can keep throughout your career. And I I, I still, I feel like I belong to Hopkins to a certain degree. That's, that's wonderful. Um, why then from big pharma into biotech? Um, have you ever worked in big pharma? I have. I spent a few years at AstraZeneca. Okay. Um, I think Big Pharma is, of course, great because, like, when you really look at it, like, you know, what Big Pharma has achieved or, like, you know, like, in terms of clinical development, commercialization, and bringing drugs to patients, this is this is a tough business. And uh, I think what pharma contributes there is, is outstanding, and I wouldn't know how we do this. Um but it's, it's organized differently. And it feels a little bit like in a town car, right? Like, you know, where you have the same temperature always irrespective, you know, what's going on outside. You have the tinted windows and like, you know, you can go and if a drug program fails, you don't really see it in the, in the, in, in the stock market, right? Like it doesn't change much. Biotech is more your convertible. Uh, it's, um, it's when it rains, it pours, just to be clear. But on a wonderful sunny day, it's beautiful. And I think that's the major difference. I just wanted that experience. That's a phenomenal metaphor. I might just have to start using that. And so now for you both, having spent over a decade, or in some case, and actually I would say over two decades in industry, over a decade in entrepreneurship, uh, you joined Third Round, Alexis in 2010, Christoph 2016. Among potential venture firms, what prompted you both to go to TRV? For me, I... Uh, Third Rock was the backer for both uh, Foundation Medicine and then for Blueprint Medicines. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was working there uh, and with the partners uh, and you know Mark Levin and uh, Kevin Starr and Neil Exter, um, just incredible people who had been part of building transformative companies. Um, and again, like <clears throat> I had gone out and at that point I had already founded uh, and built a couple companies, Combinatorics and Forma, uh, had done that in a very scrappy uh, way, learning by doing and learning uh, by the mistakes of doing. I hadn't really had the mentors or the people that had gone and done it and done it as well as it could be done. And uh, working uh, with Mark as we were uh, building foundation medicine. And as we were building blueprint medicines, I, uh, it was just so valuable to gain from that wisdom and experience. And I could feel that foundation, uh, medicine and blueprint medicines would be much more successful companies because of it. And frankly, we were just having an enormous amount of fun. Right. I mean, in the beginning, as I sort of was uh, building a foundation medicine, uh, it was like uh, uh, Mark was like, well, maybe we'll invest in it. Maybe we won't. Right. It was just sort of uh, but ultimately Third Rock did uh, and Blueprint the same thing. And those companies wouldn't have come to existence without Third Rock. Uh, and along the way, 
they say, hey, this is a lot of fun. Why don't you join us uh, in the partnership? And I was thinking, having a lot of fun building cool things that uh, was really satisfied about what they could do, going back to your earlier question and sort of that uh, North Star. And so I said, yes. Makes a lot of sense. Krista? Um, when I joined the drug discovery industry, I didn't know what VC stands for. I didn't know what those letters mean. Okay. I was very, I think that's normal for most people, actually. Um, and today we, we live it, right? Like daily. But um, I, when I became a CSO of Blueprint, um, that was also then why I got to know Alexis better. And we worked together as a team there, Alexis as the CEO for a while, myself as the CSO. And uh, um, that was enormous fun and, and um, also super successful. And Alexis was at Third Rock. <laughs> um, therefore, for me, that in fact, that's sort of what triggered this all. But I was fascinated by this concept of ideating companies. I think this is um, there's something fascinating for me about um, around having ideas and then getting those ideas into some form of implementation and like making them drugs or so. That I think is super super hard, but creative, like enormously creative, and that combination of close to impossible, but like incredible creative um, that fascinated me and uh third rock was um the original first we see and really sort of celebrated this concept i you know of of of, of company ideation and i had the, the fortune to co-chair for many years at third rock that that portion um of activity that uh really uh, like goes from idea till company build it's cool yeah, having gotten to do a little bit of work with Third Rock myself, I can absolutely agree the model there is phenomenal and the people even better. So let's take it a step forward and say, building on these considerable experiences you've talked about and so many others, you came together as co-founders with Zach Weinberg to launch Curie.bio last year, first announced, I think, publicly this February. So before we dive deeper, let's maybe take a step back and talk about the genesis of Curie.bio. What, in your opinion, was the spark that started it all? Yeah, you know, I, I and full credit to to, to Zach. Um, Zach is also a, a serial entrepreneur, um, and I, he um, had you know built his first company um, <clears throat> and taken it. Uh, sold it to Google, and then he built his second, and that was just in the ad tech space. Uh, sort of a pure tech company. And then uh, he built a second company in the health tech space, Flatiron Health, and then had sold that to Roche. And that's where I got to know Zach back when he was first starting uh, Flatiron Health. Uh, and Krishna Yeshwant from GV introduced us to each other. And Foundation Medicine and Flatiron had a whole series of different strategic relationships and discussions and partnerships uh, over the years. And then uh, Roche acquired Flatiron Health, and he was at Roche uh, for several years. And then his time at Roche uh, came to an end, and he was able to sort of move on to what's next. While he was, uh, you know, along that journey, he became a very significant seed investor uh, in the world of tech and had done several hundred seed investments in tech and had started seeing some seed investments in the world of uh, biotech. And was really surprised that the seed ecosystem in biotech was not at all like the world of tech. And he realized it didn't exist at all in the way that it does uh, on the tech side of things. Now, we also understood there's a lot of good reasons uh, for that. Uh, you know, Zach would say like in tech, first of all, you can do things for a hundred thousand or $500,000 you know, in biotech, it's usually at a minimum in, you know, a few million, then it very quickly gets up uh, more. But probably more important than that is that uh, in tech, mistakes, you make mistakes easily, usually you just recode them, right? It's it's coding and you, you get mistakes, you quickly change it, you iterate really rapidly. But again, in biotech, those might be $500,000, million dollar experiments, and more importantly, time. They might cost you six months, 12 months, uh, 18 months. So in the beginning for a founder, those mistakes can be extraordinarily expensive and difficult. 
And it's like, okay, so the seed world doesn't really exist in biotech in the way that it does in tech, but maybe could it now? Could it because one, the underlying technology is changing. There's just things we can do today in biotech that are more cost-effective or more quick, quick or more powerful than what they were 10, uh, 15, 20 years ago. Also, the world of biotech, the external vendors of what you can get done uh, without having a laboratory yourself has radically changed from what it was 10 uh, or 20 years ago. And so could you help founders? Like, could you plug in the knowledge that deeply experienced people in biotech and pharma have as far as how to leverage getting, well, a little bit like Christoph said, getting shit done, but knowing how to get shit done, what shit to get done, and having the heft of relationships to know exactly how to navigate amongst the 120 possible vendors and have the relationships and clout to make it happen. Could you take that knowledge and make it to an impedance match to the founder entrepreneurs that have an idea so they could benefit from that experience and you could make a seed ecosystem really blossom uh, in biotech. And so that was the idea, right? Like if you could say, if metaphorically, the the sorry, if the mythology in tech is that it's two guys and a dog in a garage starts the next great enterprise software, e-commerce, or now artificial intelligence, you know, chat GPT company, uh, you couldn't start a serious therapeutics company in your metaphorical garage. And the question Zach was posing was, well, maybe could you now? You know, is it possible that a guy and a girl, a dog and a cat with a creative idea that now you really could in a seed ecosystem make meaningful progress in building a biotech company? And the hypothesis is that if you build it with the right type of structure, the right type of support and access to that knowledge uh, and services that that you could. And the way this all came together, actually, and credit to uh, Krishna, uh, Krishna Yashwant of GV, um, Zach was talking with Krishna uh, about this a bunch. And uh, Krishna and I have done a lot of things together uh, over the years, including foundation medicine. Uh, and we were going for, uh, we do regular walks in the woods, uh, here in Belmont or elsewhere in the uh, the greater Boston area. And we were on one of our walks in the woods. And he said, hey, have you caught up with Zach lately? Do you know what he's up to? Um, I said, Krishna, we, uh, no, like it's a pandemic. I haven't seen Zach since before COVID. Uh, and uh, literally uh, the next day, another uh, partner in uh, the venture, the biotech venture ecosystem called me up and is like, what is this crazy idea that Zach's thinking about? Is this really even possible? So now at this point was intrigued and uh, Zach and I started uh, the conversation going. I uh, grabbed Christoph uh, to be involved and it immediately resonated with Christoph and we'd sit around sort of the, the, the fire pit in my house here and brainstorm, could we do this? And we became convinced that we could and fundamentally, as soon as we became convinced that we could, we're like, we have to do this because it's what we would have wanted when we were sort of starting our first companies in the space, because it'd be like awesome for founders. And like, if you could build, do something that's awesome for founders, make seed happen in biotech, yield net new science for society and be a good business model. Like if you could do all that, it just became one of those things you had to do. Uh, yeah, just... Maybe building off what Alexis said, um, I came into this late, right? Like, like you know, Zach and Alexis had ideated a lot around this. And uh, I'm like, ah, oh, that makes sense. But what fascinated me then is when they said, we could do like 50 companies a year. I'm like, holy shit, that's a lot of companies. And that fascinated me for several reasons. The first one is, if you don't build one or two companies a year or help founders in one or two companies a year, but actually you do this at an enormous scale, then certain things change. The first one that changes is you 
can take much more risk because um, there's a higher number. If you build one company, you know, you're a little careful. Okay, if you build 50, um, you can take more risk. And more risk means there is more innovation. And um, that concept of net new innovation just resonated with me a lot because how else will we, A, be able to sustain this business of biopharma, but also in spite of all the impact that we all had as a sort of a life science community on patients and patient suffering, there's still so much that ought to be done. And that requires that requires a new approach, that requires an approach that allows for taking risk, that requires an approach that gets more innovation into the system and um, get more founders into it. If you go to Stanford, you know, and we ask the IT students, you know, what's on their bucket list, they say, founding a company. You go to Harvard or Hopkins or Brandeis, whatever, to the biology department, I tell you, it's not on their bucket list. Okay. And there's a good reason. Because it's expensive, it's complicated, you don't have a lot of ownership, you become an advisor, um, but you're not really sort of facilitated in becoming that founder entrepreneur. And I think that's what the life science community has been missing. And uh, if Curie.bio can help that, that founder entrepreneur to support, because it's really hard to build a successful company, then... I think we all win. Thank you both. And I love the focus on not only advancing phenomenal science, but also at the same time, really helping, as you were saying, Christoph, build up that founder ecosystem as well. Because you need the people who have that expertise and can learn from folks such as yourself to really build strong companies and take things forward. They're maybe not need, but if we can help them minimize mistakes, I can absolutely see the advantage there. And so Curie.bio was launched as this fo a founder-focused seed stage venture firm that combines, and I think this is pretty critical, industry-grade therapeutics, uh, accelerator knowledge focused on helping these entrepreneurial founders launch viable therapeutics companies. And you've said that you've built Curie to be what you would have wanted when you were starting and building your biotech companies. So let's take things uh, a little bit more maybe into the day-to-day. You've talked about the goals of Curie.io, how you set it up, how it came to be. Can you tell us a little more, a little bit more about the model? What's the funnel look like? Who do you start so thinking about working with, and what does working with those people uh, really entail? Yeah, you know, so I I like to describe like what are the things we're looking for. I uh, I think I uh, I think it's pretty you know simple. Uh, one, we want to be the best place for entrepreneurial founders to go. Uh, uh, get their seed uh, round to go build their company. Uh, that's what we'd like to to earn uh, over time. Um, we think, you know, obviously we're getting a lot of proposals. And so again, be realistically, we probably will put a seed term sheet down for maybe it's like one out of a hundred, uh, something on that type uh, of order. And what are we looking for? We're looking for an idea that really causes our eyes to sparkle, right? That we're like, that is something that we think is cool, that we think is important, that we think if it worked, if you could get industrial grade data on it, that would be amazing. It'd be really transformative for disease, for patients, and therefore uh, for society. So we have to, we have to just be fundamentally excited on the idea to we need to think that on a seed check, right? Because that's what we are. As you said, that might be five, six, seven, eight million dollar type of check with a detailed experimental plan that we help the founders create that industrial experimental plan over the next 12, 18, 24 months is generally going to be the time frame. That for that amount of money in that amount of time, that we can really make a difference, right? For those founders, move uh, the needle. Uh, getting to a, a meaningful value creation. And so that will typically mean if you're going from a creative idea, uh, this target for this patient population, this way to approach this family of targets, this new computational platform for finding cryptic pockets, then use that platform on a couple incredibly important 
uh, targets and let's make progress. So can we move the best embodiment, whether somebody's creative idea is an individual target or a broad-based platform, can we move the best embodiments of that meaningfully into lead optimization an industrial grade lead optimization? Sometimes maybe that can be all the way to development candidate, but more likely sometimes in the world of leads, whereby leads, just to be clear, you know, definition, regardless of whether we're talking about a small molecule, a classic antibody, an engineered biologic, a nucleic acid-based therapy, a cell-based therapy, a radiopharmaceutical, by a bona fide lead, it means that the embodiment is potent. It is selective, so you know what it does, and it does what you want it to do, and it's not doing other things, that it has good enough pharmacological properties that you can test it in an appropriate physiological system, and that it is progressible, that anybody in the industry would look at it and say, if it's not a development candidate yet, there's enough degrees of freedom, right? We're not down a blind alley such that people reasonably skilled in the art over the next 12, 18 months can move it from a lead to being a development candidate. So item one, it's got to catch our imagination that we want to do it, that we think it could be really amazing. Two, that we can make a meaningful difference in the next five, six, seven, uh, for five, six, seven, eight million dollars over the next 12, 18, 24 months. Uh, three, that not only is it theoretically possible that you can do that, but we feel our expertise and our relationship with like 120 different vendors and our master service agreements that we know how to help the founders get it done. In other words, you could say, well, this work could be with this group at this CRO in this particular way because they're the right ones. And this group would do this asset because it's the best place in the world to go do it so that we feel we can help the execution. Because when we write seed checks, there will be plenty of times where the science right, just doesn't pan out. That's okay. That's the risk we're taking as seed investors. What we don't want to fail our founders on is that the execution of the plan we're there to help them make sure that that it's executed efficiently on those dollars so that they get that answer. So we want to feel confident we can execute on the plan for them. And then finally, that it's with people we want to we want to work with because people, 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 and that fundamentally matters. And maybe I can add a couple of things. Uh, the first one is in that effort, we have perfect alignment with the founders. We aim for this glorious Series A. We aim for developing a plan to get and generating the data that makes the Series A a walk in the park. That's our fundamental alignment and that's close to perfect. Now getting there doesn't only take money as Alexis said, but an enormous experience and uh, uh, support that comes in many different flavors. And uh, that's where, um, we put our effort in and uh, um, if a founder team and they tend to be small, right, you know, and that's good because that makes it efficient, right? It's all about how efficient can you be in your drug discovery? Can you minimize your fixed cost? Can your costs basically only be driven by activities rather than by like, you know, people and nice offices and the lab and what you have, okay? And in that, then we can support. We can support with our experience and our teams that are hardcore experienced drug discoverers. But um, also, if that founder team doesn't have a chemist, we are your chemist. And if that team lacks a, bio lacks a biophysic, we are your biophysicist for a while. Till you have the data to hire the best, the world's best biophysicist at a later stage. And in between, we are there. If that makes it super um, powerful and that allows young early teams to stay efficient while not paying the price of being inexperienced or having to wing it. I love that mentality of support. And so as we think about your assessment of startups, as we think about what you, uh, which companies you're going to engage with and are likely already starting to engage with, as investors, you've called yourselves drug hunters previously. So that being the case, and Alexis, you talked about all of the different modality types you're exploring, and I'm sure there are many others. That being the case, would you say you're thesis driven or maybe taking it a step back and thinking about things more broadly? 
Uh, you said you have to be excited by the idea. You have to see the alignment and be able to make a meaningful impact. But can you share um, how maybe you separate the signal from the noise as you evaluate companies and what uh, about the Curie.bio process really differs? And I'm sure uh, Christoph will have a, a bunch of comments on this as well. Um, I'll put it and say that we have to believe in the targets you want to go after. And this comes in a couple of different fronts. So let's say you have a platform that is a new way of creating drugs. Okay, that's awesome. What is the best embodiment of that platform in a drug, right? Um, now that might seem to be a trivial question, but oftentimes people don't have it. So uh, we're not interested in platforms just because the technology is cool. I mean, we love it. We geek out on that too. But the point is, when you're focused on therapeutics, the platform is there to help you make a better drug that matters, that's going to make a transformative difference for disease. And a lot of people sometimes get caught up on a platform where they're like, oh, this is super cool. Okay, awesome. It's super cool because it's going to let you do what? And you need to have those first target concepts and the target product profile. I think this platform helps me create this and this thing would be amazing. Or if somebody just has an individual target idea, right? This is why this would be amazing for this patient population. So you have to believe fundamentally in what the application is going to be. And we're always asking people, what's your first best application? What's your best embodiment of your idea? And why is that something that is amazing and important and needs to happen? That will usually mean that you understand the molecular mechanism of a disease and the process of what's going on. Because if you don't have that, then usually it means there's some phenomenological, you know, hand waving going on, and that's a blind leap. And so usually to be fundamentally excited, you can say, we understand what is happening in this group of patients, at least we believe we understand, from a molecular mechanism perspective. And that's why if we modulate this target in this way, it's going to yield something really important for these patients. And now here's my insight as to why we can modulate this target in this way, or my platform that will enable us to modulate this target uh, in this way. So fundamentally, we need to believe in your best embodiment or two of why that would be an incredible drug. Yeah, and in that context, we hope we can also be helpful. Like a classical investor might look at a company and say, oh, that's an exciting platform. But this first program with that target, nah. And that's the end of that relationship. In our case, I hope that's not how it comes, how it happens. Because what about we were to change that first problem? What about after getting sort of really sort of understanding from the founders what the technology does and is possible to achieve whatever, to think together what would be the best drug embodiment for this? Could it solve a problem that is really important or could it make a drug that one couldn't make before? And we brainstorm that together and come up together with the founders like in defining that. We call that process elevate. Okay, We try to work with the founders to elevate their concepts and, uh, and programs or whatever so that it looks then okay in the beginning Maybe interesting, but then you look at it and it's like all of a sudden it's beautiful. And that's where we think we can make a contribution and that requires a lot of experience. And uh, we'll be wrong, we'll be often wrong. And that's unfortunate, but it's the truth. Um, but at moments we can help in that process and then rather a company never getting a chance, I think we can help them to, um, to get a good to a good place and that that's really important so as we think about this elevation process and finding founders to work with and this is for you both do you have recommendations for founders who are reaching out to curie.bio i mean like for me the most important thing is are you solving an important 
problem. Okay, it's great. As Alexis said, we get fascinated by technology. Like there's so many cool things, and that is it's part of it. But are you solving a real problem? Um, that's a good start. I can tell you. Okay, and uh, it's a really good start. Um, I think, and we all struggle with this at times, but you want to be self-confident, but you also want to be humble. I mean, making a drug is so difficult and it requires sort of that collaboration, that spirit of, you know something better than I do. And then there are moments it's the other way around. And in that community, so sort of to build a, a company or a drug together, um, I think that's just like, it's a requirement. And, and um, maybe the third element is you better are good at something, you know? I have a lot of good friends, you know, they're good at bowling or like, at, you know, they have an aquarium at home and like a fish. And, but they're just not good truck discoverers. And um, therefore those, not so much. But like, if a nice person, if you really care about it, if you want to solve a problem, and if you understand that this is something that we have to do together and we all screw up often, and then you make your contribution in this, then you're up to something. Well said. Alexis, did you want to add your thoughts? Uh, we're easy to reach. Uh, you can go through our website. Uh, you can ping in uh, to any of us. Um, we actually literally look at everything. And we'll get back to you. And, uh, you know, we're making a point of that. And we'll share uh, what we think because uh, we really admire founder entrepreneurs and we want to be helpful. We know that we're going to say no far more often than we'll say yes. Uh, uh, and it's just sort of it's the nature of things, but we want to be as helpful as we can. No, I love that message of collaboration and support. And I know we've talked about elevating the scientific process and the drug discovery process and by the same uh, drug development process, shall we say. And as we think about that sort of streamlining contrasted with the lengthy life cycle of forging life science companies in particular, it often feels like building teams and company culture, especially with intentionality, can really be critical. So as an investor and as a partner, who's working with these companies from the earliest stages of company formation through that uh, initial growth. How do you think about supporting teams and helping founders build successful companies beyond just uh, in the scientific space? Christoph? Yeah, sometimes I think about what if a company or a VC would be a person? How would you describe that person? How would the person career.bio look like? Maybe it's a good friend that has seen a lot and becomes your mentor in the process of something that's important to you. Maybe that's the person bio. And I think in building the companies themselves, mm -hmm. one of the things that curie.bio we hope enables some of the founding entrepreneurs is you have the couple of founders, small team, and Christoph mentioned this earlier, Maybe it's just two people. Maybe it's three people. They don't need to be teams of 10, 15, 20 people at this stage yet. And what we hope is that we hope that we can help that founder team by the services and experience and mentoring, get to the point where those founders really have that industrial grade drug embodiment and the data supporting their thesis. Because... Chris, I agree with entirely with your point. This is an industry that it's a 10 year, if not 15 year product development cycle. You need to build an organization that arcs over a long period of time. And that organization probably is going to partner with other organizations. The people elements over time is non-trivial and is really important. We're hopeful that part of what we're doing here is that once you actually have industrial grade leads on your first or second and third embodiments, you, with real data now, you have a basis for recruiting a really strong team purposefully and mindfully, as you said, around that idea. And so something that we've certainly seen over time is some companies in our industry 
the habit's been developed of just building this enormous thing from the beginning. And a lot of energy gets spent. And a lot of those companies have just done a lot of activity, but haven't really moved downstream in a productive manner. Um, so if you actually are a little further and have a little bit of data, maybe now you can assemble an even higher quality team more purposefully that really can be tremendous. Because oftentimes really high quality people want to see some of those early proof points and embodiments. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. And by the same token, as you bring these people together, they'll be learning from you and hopefully interacting with each other as well and having that opportunity to continue growing and building together. So it really is that uh, supportive ecosystem as well. And so we know you're just getting started over at Curie.bio, but we'd love to ask, I guess, A, how's it going? And then B, what's coming next? Alexis, do you want to kick things off? Well, I, you know, we're just getting going, as you said, I, and there's a lot of uh, work to be done. Um, we've, you know, uh, done four seed investments so far, uh, about to do a couple more. Uh, we've said, you know, maybe by the end of this year, we've done 10 to 15. Uh, maybe next year we can do 15 to 25. Um, we're about 25 people at Curie.bio right now. By the end of this year, we'll probably be at about 50, and then we'll probably grow to like 60 or 70. Again, the majority of those people uh, are not your classic investor phenotypes. The majority of those people are people that have 15, 20 years of real pragmatic drug discovery and development experience and that know how to lead programs and, and get that done. So our focus right now is building a uh, Curie.bio uh, and hopefully delivering uh, an amazing experience for the founders that we're, we're trying to support. So uh, this is an entrepreneurial build in Curie.bio itself and uh, lots of work to be done. Having built a lot of these, we will make mistakes. We will not get it right all the time. Uh, hopefully we will learn from those uh, and you know uh, get better and better at it. Yeah. Um... We believe that we, as we discussed in founder entrepreneurs, therefore this is not those companies are not our companies. Uh, every company is the company of the founders, and um, that also means we can only help if founders come to us. And as Alexis said, our big goal is that yeah, we aspire that over time we get every founder's first phone call because. People say we are writing big checks, but you know who, write, who writes the biggest check? That's the founder. Because they need to sit down with their friends and their families and say, over the next two years, weekends, evenings, tough. Therefore, as a founder, you want to optimize on your probability of success, and we hope we can help with that. I think that's going to be critically important moving forward, especially with the rise of so much phenomenal and often interdisciplinary uh, technology that's moving forward and moving the needle in bio and biotech broadly. So two very quick rapid fire questions just to wrap things up. Uh, and I know we could do another hour on this, if not more. But first and foremost, do you have any advice for those maybe earlier in their careers? and seeking to pursue company building. Krista? Take the risk. If you believe in something, give it a shot. Give it a shot. Don't like whatever, like go for it. Alexis? Yeah, no, totally agree. If, you know, know yourself, know are you an entrepreneur or not? There's a lot of people that want to say that they're an entrepreneur, but they're not because they're not comfortable uh, with the risk. That's okay. Right. Uh, but if you are comfortable with that risk, it's awesome. It's a beautiful thing to go uh, and do. There is real risk. So choose a problem that matters. You know, one of the things I've found is somebody wise said this to me when I was just uh, when I was young, whether you're building something small or you're building something large, they take the same amount of work. 
So pick a problem that really, really matters. If you're going to build, build big. <laughs> nice. Or at least maybe not build big, but try to uh, address something significant. So we've talked a lot about the professional today. Thank you so much for sharing more about Curie.io. But maybe let's take a step back also and just ask something personal and say, Christoph, you were talking about bowling earlier. How do you guys like to spend your free time? Alexis, do you want to take this one first? You know, I people always say, hey, what's your hobby? I mean, honestly, my hobby is building companies. I feel so fortunate and lucky that I just love what we do. Um, I also am very lucky, have a large family. I've got an incredible wife and four uh, amazing children. Uh, between building companies uh, and sort of the time and effort there and my family and children and the time and effort there, uh, that's everything. Yeah, and a good balance. Yeah. I love soccer, right? Like Chelsea is my favorite team. But um, every three minutes, I think um, I want to spend with my family, with my wife, Barbara, and our three daughters. Um, that's super important to me. And one day, I'll get that balance right. Uh, I love the aspiration, and I hope it's so for all of us. <laughs> uh, as we come to a close, any closing thoughts, shameless plugs, anything we didn't ask or didn't cover that you'd love to put out there? Like, if you're a founder, what can you lose by reaching out to curry.bio? Think of a good idea. Web page, call, email, Twitter, whatever it is. Um, we'll try to be helpful. Even if we say we don't think that's the greatest idea or like it's not for us. But even in that, we try to be respectful and helpful and just, just call. And Chris, thanks for taking the time and inviting us uh, here for the podcast. We really appreciated it. Absolutely. And thank you both Alexis and Christoph for an absolutely fantastic episode. We are very grateful for your time. Thank you again for sharing the Curie.bio story and a little bit of your backgrounds as well. We look forward to hopefully having you back soon. And I'm going to echo Christoph your point there. It sounds like there's a lot of value to be gained for founders reaching out. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now. 